My name is Cheyenne Seigneault. I'm a startup business development manager for early stage startups uh, based in France. Um, like Rob, I'm also an ex-founder. Uh, I uh, co-founded two startups, one in telecoms, uh, another one in hospitality, and I uh, helped raise Series B for a Danish startup um, that was focused on HR tech uh, before joining AWS a couple years ago. Um, I'm going to start off with another video. Uh, this is a launch video for something called Amazon Go. Who here has heard of Amazon Go? Okay, let me quickly explain it. The video will explain for itself, but it's essentially a new shopping experience that we've invented on behalf of our customers, where you can walk into the Amazon Go store, pick up what you want, and just walk out. Right? There's no tail. Just walk in, walk out. It's actually a pretty uh, trippy experience. Um, I will let the video speak for itself. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out Technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. No lines, no checkout. No, seriously. Why did I show you this video? Because innovation for innovation's sake is useless. You have to innovate on behalf of your customers. You have to innovate on behalf of your customers. At Amazon, we firmly believe that customers are wonderfully dissatisfied. They don't know it yet. They don't know that they're dissatisfied. But if you know, and you invent on their behalf or reinvent on their behalf, powerful things can happen, right? And we know this because we've been doing it for 25 years. Um, We've been inventing for 25 years, and we've been looking at it not just on behalf of our customers, but also enabling invention, right? So when we look at innovation, we're not looking at it just on behalf of our customers. We're also looking at how we can innovate for our developers, for our product engineers, for our startup business development managers. Um, how can we innovate from within and without? And that's, that's super important, and it's a driving tenant for what we do here at Amazon. I want to talk to you about day one. This is a copy of the, uh, or a snapshot of the first uh, annual shareholder letter that Jeff sent to uh, our shareholders when we went public in 1997. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, the most important part here is the, word, the, the words day one. And we believe at Amazon that it's always day one. What does that mean? It means that we're the beginning of everything that can happen with the internet. You saw the Thorn video, right? You saw how inspiring it is to basically solve really challenging use cases with machine learning algorithms, right? We're just at the beginning of what we can do with AI, right? <clears throat> We're the beginning of what we can do with cloud computing. We're the beginning of e-commerce, right? Even though e-commerce has been going on for 20 plus years, we're still at the beginning of that. And we shouldn't forget it because it's still day one.
And we know this because we started off as, you know, in our humble beginnings as the world's largest bookstore, right? Uh, and we didn't stop there, right? We got into the home. So I don't know if you guys know Alexa or Echo devices, but these are the smart home speakers that are now embedded into cars. The software is actually embedded in cars and other devices. We came into your home and are helping you simplify your life, right, from within. We changed the way people start reading books. Um, we changed the way people shop. You saw the Amazon Go video, but in other markets, unfortunately not in South Africa yet, you can wake up in the morning and go, damn it, I need some bread, I need some toilet paper, I need a toothbrush, and fire up your app, and within two hours, you have it. That's insane, right? Um, video streaming, home entertainment with a Fire TV. I realize that you don't have access to some of these products in your markets right now, but they are coming, and they are changing the way our consumers uh, are, are living their lives, right? And consumers are living their lives. And then AWS, right? AWS in 2006, everyone thought, everyone thought we were kind of nuts, right? Like inverting all of our data centers and our capabilities and providing them to others so that they could innovate, right? Like us. And, 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 and we gave birth to AWS. Um, it's a really interesting story that I'm not going to dive into today about how AWS was formed. But So our mission is to be Earth's most customer-centric company. And I know you're like, okay, that's really broad, right? But it's broad on purpose. It's broad on purpose, why? Because we don't know where we're gonna innovate. We don't know what we're, what we're gonna do next, right? So we, we wanted to give our mission statement being broad enough to allow ourselves the margin and maneuver to adapt to conditions or invent on behalf of our customers. Now, that mission statement is grounded by a commitment. And that commitment is to make our lives, customers' lives easier. Whether you're a developer, a builder, a consumer, a mother, right? Our job is, our mission and our commitment is to make our customers' lives easier. So as you're thinking about your startup, right? Think about that. Think about how you're making your customers' lives easier or your partners or your resellers, whatever you are, a B2B or a B2C business. And how do you do that? Well, at Amazon, there's two things that you're gonna hear me, uh, two phrases you're gonna hear me say several times today. One is customer obsession, and the other one's working backwards, right? One of the key mechanisms at Amazon is something called the working backwards mechanism, right? And it's really interesting, uh, and I'm gonna give you a glimpse into that today, and I'm gonna dive deep into what that is. Um, but start with your customer and work backwards. So let's take some examples of where we've done that. So this is a fulfillment center. This is one of our first earlier generation fulfillment centers. A fulfillment center, for those of you that don't know, is the warehouses, basically, where we store all the inventory that we then ship out right, to our customers. And there's hundreds of these, right? Now, in the beginning, what we did was we would store all this stuff in a warehouse, and then you'd have a picker, right? And a picker goes and takes the order and picks up the stuff from the various aisles and shelves and then sends them to a packer. Right, brings them to a packer who then packs it and fulfills the order, right? So that's, that, that process, we looked at it and we were like, damn, like, what can we do about this? Like, this is not efficient. Uh, it, it's, we want to we wanna basically be able to fulfill orders faster. What do we do? Well, we uh, started using AI and machine learning and robots, right? So Kiva is uh, a robotic platform that we use. And what they do is we got hundreds of these, right? thousands of these deployed. Uh, actually 100,000 deployed worldwide, where they actually automatically bring the stuff to the packer based on orders in the right order, in the right sequence, so that the packer just needs to basically take things from the top, sorry, take things from the top and fulfill the order. What did that do? Well, that changed our ability to change shipping times. So when we say, when we started off with, well, I'll get to this in a minute, but it, it completely allowed us to change the customer experience by innovating from within, right? Another example is the Amazon.com website. Now, in North America, this is the number one search engine for products, right? Uh, this page changes 100 times a day, right? We're constantly testing it, constantly tweaking it all the time, 
right? And you'll see later how that's architected. But really, really impressive website. Amazon Go, I'm not gonna dive into that. You saw the video, it explained itself. So these are all the examples of us innovating on behalf of our customer, right? From within, from without. Um, our culture of innovation is underpinned by four tenets, right? Customer obsession. And you'll hear me say that again and again, but we start with the customer and work backwards. Long-term thinking. I'll give you an example of how you need to be stubborn on your vision. You as entrepreneurs need to be stubborn on your vision, but you also need to be flexible on the details, right? And I'll show you why in a minute. It's quite funny. You also need to embrace a culture where it's okay to fail, okay? And I know as a startup, that's really scary. I've been there, right? Because sometimes failing could make or break your business, right? And you've, you've, heard, you've heard the phrases, fail fast, fail early, right? It's true, but it's okay to fail. And I'll give you examples of how you can create a culture where failure is acceptable. Um, you also have to be willing to be misunderstood. So uh, you have to create meaning, right? To create meaning in what you do, you have to be strong in your vision, you have to be committed, and you have to be willing to have people say, this is not gonna work. You have to take that on board. People are gonna try and mess with your mind sometimes. Just, just stay, stay, stay the course. Stay the course. Don't let people influence your vision, okay? I'll explain why. So, I wanna talk about Amazon's growth flywheel. This is not something that's specific to retail. It's specific to anything, any business that you do, right, or build. You have to think about what your growth flywheel is, right? In some cases, you may be a data intensive company, right? So data could be an underpinning part of your, of your growth flywheel strategy. For us, the way we look at it is, we want to optimize and, and better the customer experience. How do we do that? We want to increase the selection that they have. See, an example of retail, right? Uh, you know, more categories. Um, having more categories and more selection means more customers. More customers means uh, uh, more demand, more traffic to our website, reduced prices with our partners. And then we do structural changes as well, like the fulfillment center stuff, which reduces our cost structure, which reduces the lower prices and then increases the value. So the flywheel is really about creating value for the customer, increasing their selection, and making it convenient for them to consume either your product, your services. For us, it could be AWS services. Uh, it applies for every part of our business. And, and it, it, we, we really apply that to everything we do, right? At scale, we always talk about it at Amazon. It's like, hey, um, okay, this works. Now, how does it work at scale? So we're always thinking about scale because with cloud computing and what you saw with Rob's presentation is you can achieve scale super fast, super fast, right? So an example of how that iterates over time is a service called Amazon Prime. Um, who here has heard of Amazon Prime? Okay, good, that's good. Because um, I think you got Prime Video in South Africa or something like that, right? So Prime started off as a, as a it's still a membership program and it helps, uh, it was meant to basically reduce uh, shipping times, right? So if you were a Prime member, you would get two-day shipping, free premium two-day shipping, which was at the time unheard of, right? Because USPS was basically, and FedEx and DHL were all the people that were fulfilling last mile orders. Now, that was in 07. Along with that, right, seven years later, we started adding to Prime, right? We started adding services, uh, video, uh, storage, and then in 2015, we launched Prime Music, free same-day delivery, which was never heard of, right, in the industry of e-commerce. And today, uh, even going beyond 2016, you got services like Prime Now, right? And Prime Now is the service I was telling you about, where you can use your Amazon app, right, Prime Now app, order food, order Xbox controllers, games, and you can get them delivered within a two hour window. And that's kind of crazy, right? And the way we do that is, well, we also innovate from within. So we launched Amazon Flex in the United States where anyone can become a, a driver, uh, a last mile driver and get paid for it. 
Um, so, so we have people that are basically fulfilling the orders for us down to the last kilometer, the last hundred meters. Okay. So that's really kind of an example of, of, of customer obsession at work. I want to talk about being stubborn on the vision and being flexible on the details. Let's talk about the Kindle, right? Who here is a Kindle? Not bad, not bad. So the first Kindle, uh, well, we invented the Kindle because we wanted to have, uh, enable customers to have hundreds of thousands of books or tens of thousands of books at their fingertips, right? And the general idea was, hey, wouldn't it be great if you could have at least four to five books, right, available? It would be the first version. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that way, right? So the left, the product on the left is our first Kindle. It actually weighed more than, more than, more than a single book, right? Uh, but, you know, it had a lot of buttons. We thought we could use it for browsing. You know, browsing was the thing right, right back then. Um, but if you think about the vision, right, the vision was the same, right? Books at your fingertips, a library, an infinite library, right, with the cloud. Today we have the paper white, right? And the paper white's awesome. It, you know, you can take it to the beach and you can still read. Uh, it's got long battery life, it's super thin. Um, you can kind of throw it in your bag, it won't necessarily break easily, so it's kind of rugged. Um, this is a typical example of being stubborn on the vision, right, but flexible on the details. We, we, there's a radical difference between what you see on the left and what you see on the right, and it's not due to technology evolution. It's about us understanding that maybe we didn't need all these buttons in the first place, right? Um, an example of being uh, willing to be misunderstood. Uh, people have always constantly questioned what we do as a business. Um, but somehow, sometimes it's worked out the best, sometimes it hasn't. Uh, one of the things where it actually really worked out is AWS, right? When we launched AWS, um, everyone thought, what are you guys doing? Focus on e-commerce. You're an e-commerce company. You're a book-selling company. What are you doing getting into IT? You don't know how to sell into IT. Well, we kind of showed them, really, because Wall Street kind of loves the AWS side of our business now. And the reason is because we were stubborn as hell, right? We made it easier for people to self-serve and launch and build products in a way that no one thought possible back then. And yeah, it started with storage, some basic compute, some notification. But now, as you saw, it's what, 165 services? Yeah, impressive. Um, so now I want to talk about organization for innovation. And we basically have mechanisms. We have architectural recommendations on how you should architect for innovation and culture, as well as team management, right? Some of these, uh, my colleague Bijal, who's up there, will actually dive deep into this afternoon in her session on maintaining your startup DNA as you scale. Um, so she'll dive into a lot of these uh, in more detail. So working backwards from the customer, what is it? Well, ultimately, it's really simple, but it's really hard to do, right? It's about envisioning what your customer needs, right? Uh, brainstorming what your customer needs. And we do that with various questions that we ask ourselves consistently. Um, we also do something very strange, which is we write a press release. The first thing we do, once we've done the brainstorm, is we turn that brainstorm into a press release. And we project ourselves into the future. And we say, hey, what would the press release look like at launch? Right? And we write this two, three years ahead of a launch. This is the, uh, a sample of the press release for the Kindle when we were building it. Right? And we said 2007, we will launch the Kindle. We talked about the price points. We talked about the partners. We talked about the impact, the benefit that the Kindle would have. And, and we wrote that before we wrote a single line of code. Right? And how do we write that? Well, we asked ourselves questions. Who's the customer that you're building for? What's the problem or the opportunity that you're targeting? Is the benefit clear or is it wavy or hazy? Um, how do you know what customers need or want? How did you find that out? And what does the customer experience look like? Actually, the third one, finding out the customer benefit, is actually what I find the hardest. It's the one that you struggle with, because you realize that maybe sometimes you're building something 
That's really a solution looking for a problem to solve. Right? So when you think about your innovation, that third one, the business benefit, is it clear? Is it crystal clear? Can you measure it? Right? Will you measure it? How will you measure it? A mechanism is not a process. A mechanism is a closed loop right, process where you can audit, control, and iterate how your process is functioning. And that's what's really important is working backwards process. It's not a one-off, right? You're iterating. Um, we also write a frequently asked questions document, an FAQ, right? We, we write a customer FAQ. It allows us to dive deep into the details on what the customer experience is gonna look like. We also do a stakeholder FAQ, so a lot of you are gonna be startups, you're gonna have investors, hopefully, although I understand that South Africa is an underfunded market. Um, but you might have stakeholders. They may be internal, they may be an angel investor, an advisor. Um, you need to be able to explain things to them, right? Your resellers could also be stakeholders, right? So, you know, you're gonna ask yourself the hard questions, and this is really important. You really need to not shy away from asking hard questions, which is why we review these documents with a lot of people, right? Uh, internally, but also externally, right? When we're comfortable doing so. And, where you get really rich stuff coming out of this process is when the questions are hard, right? If someone's asking you really hard questions, then your document, your FAQ is gonna get better and your press release is gonna be amazing. Um, we also visualize what this is gonna look like. And I know, you know a lot of people are thinking about like design thinking or lean startup, fine. But what we believe is the, the fidelity of your mock-up is correlated to the maturity of your idea, right? So if you're just thinking, just draw stuff. You can write a comic strip, right? Make it easy to understand. And then together with all of that, you write the manual. And that's basically how we start off thinking about innovation, right? Working backwards is asking yourself these five questions, writing these documents, writing the press release. And it's really interesting because, and, and, and Jeff says this really well, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, yield the floor to him so you can talk about it uh, on the video, but working backwards, uh, the press release is typically what you see is engineering, builds a product, throws it over the wall to marketing, and then marketing markets it. And, and, and you do a press release launch. Well, that process is actually messed up. It should be the other way around. So let's hear Jeff talk about it. Uh, is the working backwards process optional? It sounds great, but it seems like a lot of work. Um, oh boy, how do we begin? Um, well, uh, the working backwards process should not be optional unless you know a better way. And, um, and you shouldn't know a better way until you've tried the working backwards process several times. The working pro backwards process really does work. And, and this particular thing here, it sounds great, but it seems like a lot of work. Done correctly, the working backwards process is a huge amount of work, but it saves you even more work later. The working backwards process is not designed to be easy. It's designed to save huge amounts of work on the back end and to make sure that we're actually building the right thing. What so many companies do is they build the, they build the, the they write the software, that's a lot of work, they get it all working, and then they throw it over the wall of the marketing department and say, okay, here's what we built. Write the press release for it. That's, that process is the one that's actually backwards. So I think that's pretty clear, right? Working backwards is a key process. It's hard. Um, focusing on customer benefits is key, right? Uh, and, and, and writing this press release is actually a great process to figure out what your end state's going to look like. Right, what's the end customer experience going to look like? Let's talk about architecture for a second. Now, I'm not a technical guy, right? That's uh, Rob. But let me show you a chart that I can't explain. <laughs> right? So this is a conceptual theoretical view of what the Amazon.com website looked like in the early days. Um, it's very, very monolithic, right? As we like to say. And, um, you know, what was, what was wrong with that? Well, it made it very hard for us to be agile, right? Whenever we wanted to make changes, we had to talk to six different teams to get that done. We had to do integration testing, regression testing, functional testing, and it just took forever, right? And we got sick and tired of it, right? So we started 
doing something called microservices before the cool kids called it that, right? Uh, and, and we decided to structure our website and decompose our website, deconstruct it, and create microservices for every function that we wanted to implement. So this is actually a map of what that looks like today. And please don't expect, uh, don't expect me to dive deep into that. I don't, it's not like a minority report thing where I zoom in and show you stuff. Although that's a good idea. <laughs> so we decided to build single purpose functions. Single purpose services. Everything's connected through AT APIs over web services, HTTPS. Um, and we're largely black box. Like these services are black box from each other. Um, every team can be the CEO of a service. You build it. You run it, okay? That's our policy. And um, yeah, it's called microservices today. Back then, it was just what we did, right? Um, and uh, this is super important because it gives you that agility, right? You'll hear a concept later down this in presentation and this afternoon on two pizza teams. But we believe that development of a feature should never, never exceed the number of people that can be fed by two medium-sized American pizzas, right? Um, also, self-service. Make it easy for your builders to build, right? So we believe that because we deployed and launched AWS to, for, to help you do that. Um, you don't want IT as a gatekeeper. You don't want your ops people to be gatekeepers. You don't want gatekeepers. If you want innovation, fire up a server, fire up a function, right? And develop and build, right? Don't gatekeep. Allow people to boldly experiment, right? Without, without constraint. I'm not going to go into that because Rob did, <laughs> and I'm uncomfortable with that slide. But no, more seriously, um, building blocks, right? So we provide the building blocks, 165 services across compute, network, storage, databases, AI, IoT, developer tools, security, compliance, everything to basically focus on building versus focusing on the undifferentiated heavy lifting that we talked about earlier. Let's talk about culture. Now, Amazon has a really, really strong culture. Uh, probably the strongest culture I've ever seen in any company. It drives everything that we do, right? We have these things called the leadership principles. And the leadership principles are meant for us to help basically drive this hiring process of hiring builders and letting them build. We want people that innovate at the gate. We want people that can invent and simplify things all the time. We strive to, f to find these people. And to do that, we have these leadership principles. And they're not just talking points. We use these leadership principles four to five times a day when arguing, when discussing, when decisioning, right? Even coming here to Johannesburg, right? And doing a startup day, right? Why? Well, we want to earn trust. It's one of our le leadership principles. Right? We want, to, um, we want to basically deliver results for this market. We want to be customer obsessed in this market. Right? So we talk about things, we use these words all the time, like, hey, Bijal, uh, let me dive deep with you on this. Right? Or, hey, Cheyenne, are you sure that that dinner is frugal? Right? Or do you think that that marketing event that you're spending $20,000 on is frugal? We think about these things every day. They drive all of our narratives. Bijal is actually going to dive deep into this and in how the leadership principles have impacted the way we hire. I strongly recommend you look at that because if I ever set up a startup company again, I'm going to use some of these mechanisms for sure. Organization. You've heard this before. Experiment, experiment, experiment. If you're not fearing to fail, you're not running an experiment. Right? If you're not experimenting, you're not innovating. So, experiment early and frequently. Don't be afraid. Right? There are decisions that you will make in your startup that are one-way decisions, one-way door decisions, or two-way door decisions. So whenever we talk about big decisions that need to be made internally at Amazon, we think about it, is this like a one-way door? Like We can't come back from this? Like It's game on? Or it's a two-way door? If it's a two-way door, just go through it. Go through it. We have a, a leadership principle called have backbone, disagree, and commit. Right? Fight, argue, go through that door.
commit, right? And then roll back if you can, right? <laughs> but more importantly, if it's a one-way door, then start doing things that are Amazonian as well, which is write a narrative. We're a, paper, we're, we're, we're a writing company. We don't believe that PowerPoint expresses precision. So we write down what we want in six-page narratives, two-page narratives, but we write it down so that we can be precise. And precision is key when you're communicating between engineering and product guys or marketing and sales. Precision is so important. And a PowerPoint uh, does not a roadmap make, right? So that's one thing. So yeah, so failure and invention are inseparable twins. So this is a shareholder letter in 2015. So by the way, um, if you guys haven't read the shareholder letters that Jeff writes, I strongly recommend that you actually, they're available on the website. There's even, you can Google, like some people have actually said like the 15 lessons learned. Um, look at them because there's some really interesting nuggets of information here. Um, but failure and invention are inseparable. So if you know in advance that something's gonna work, it's not invention, right? So learn from your failures. Um, the failure that I'd like to talk the most on this slide is the Fire Phone. Um, the Fire Phone is something that we, att we attempted to get into the mobile phone market and epically failed, right? Uh, it, it was a disaster, we discontinued it. It was the biggest flop we've ever had. Big commitment, that was a one-way door <laughs> once we went through it. Um, but what was really nice about this was we, we, there was a feature on the Fire Phone that we knew our users absolutely loved. And it was the la natural language processing way before it's time. This is way before Siri, way before you know, uh, Alexa even. And this feature is really became the seed of what became Amazon Alexa today. So for those of you that don't know, Alexa is our voice platform, right? So we believe that in the future, we will be communicating more through voice than any other mechanism, right, or system. So we doubled down on this, and we took this team and started scaling this out and started building our devices around this. So we built the first Echo, and the Echo device was the first smart speaker on the market at scale that was smart enough to hear you respond and speak to you, right? And we keep innovating on a voice platform. A lot of what Alexa is today is underpinned by AWS. Right? So if you want to start b building voice interactions or building voice applications, have natural language processing, or speech to text, text to speech comprehension, all of that is available through AWS today in our AI and ML services. So you, know, you could basically build your own voice applications at this point. So last point on, on, on organization is the two pizza teams I was talking about. So at Amazon, the moment that your team started getting to a size where they're, they're, they're not fed by two pizzas, i.e. six to 10 people, um, we break down the teams again. So we, we, we go back down and basically hire, basically scale it down and basically back to three teams, but smaller area of focus, deeper area of focus. Um, so small decentralized teams give us the agility to move fast and be nimble. Um, and we keep in mind that when you build it, you run it, right? And that's important. It, it's, it's the most important point because otherwise that won't work. It's gonna collapse, It'll, that, that system will implode. So you build it, you run it. Um, so to summarize, if we look at the Amazon innovation equation, it's actually pretty simple on a slide. Uh, it's a function of mechanisms, like working backwards, architecture, right? Go serverless. Go microservice, be nimble. Uh, to the power of a very strong culture and an organization that supports that culture, all right? Now, on a slide, it looks easy. It's not. But hopefully, some of the sessions today will help you sort of dive deep on how you could do some of that. And we'll talk about, Bijan will talk about examples of other startups that have done some, something similar, right? So I want to close out with... Uh, really summarizing what it's been like for 25 plus years, right, for Amazon. We've stuck with three big ideas in the 25 plus years that we've been in business. Put the customer first. Invent, right, don't be afraid of failure. And be patient, right? Be, be strong on the vision, stubborn on the vision, right? Flexible on the details, right? Be willing to be misunderstood for long periods of time. 
right? And then that gives you that, that space to, at scale, innovate. It's not impossible for a startup to think that way from day one. We were a startup. AWS was a startup, barely just over 10 years ago, right? But you can scale fast, build yourself that runway.